Hello and welcome to Jonathan's Arrow, where we aim to shoot for the truth of the whole Word of God. In today's study, we are going to be looking into Proverbs chapter 30 and seeing God's wisdom for us there. But before we do, let us go to the Lord in prayer and prepare our hearts for this message today. Dear Lord, my God and my Redeemer, I want to thank you and praise you for giving me of your grace, your mercy, and your truth in my life. I pray that I would be a good witness and that I would help share that grace, mercy, and truth with all those around me. I pray that, Lord Jesus, you would lead and guide in this study today and help us all to have your wisdom. As I pray these things in your precious, holy, and righteous name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Let us begin by reading Proverbs chapter 30. The words of Agur, the son of Jacob, even the prophecy, the man spake unto Ithiel, even unto Ithiel and Eucal. Surely I am more brutish than any man, and have not the understanding of a man. I neither learned wisdom, nor have the knowledge of the holy. Who hath ascended up to, unto heaven, or descended? Who hath gathered the winds in his fists? Who hath bound the waters in a garment? Who hath established all the ends of the earth? What is his name, and what is his son's name, if thou canst tell? Every word of God is pure, he is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. Two things have I required of thee, deny me them not before I die. Remove far from me vanity and lies. Give me neither poverty nor riches, feed me with food convenient for me. Lest I be fool and deny thee, and say, Who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal, and take the name of my God in vain. Accuse not a servant unto his master, lest he curse thee, and thou be found a liar. There is a generation that curseth their father, and doth not bless their mother. There is a generation that are pure in their own eyes, and yet is not washed from their filthiness. There is a generation, oh, how lofty are their eyes, and their eyelids are lifted up. There is a generation whose teeth are as swords, and their jaw teeth as knives, to devour the poor from off the earth, and the needy from among men. The horse leech hath two daughters crying, Give, give. There are three things that are never satisfied, yea, four things say not it is enough. The grave and the barren womb, the earth that is not filled with water, and the fire that saith not, it is enough. The eye that mocketh at his father, and despiseth to obey his mother, the ravens of the valley shall pick it out, and the young eagles shall eat it. There be three things which are too wonderful for me, yea, four which I know not. The way of an eagle in the air, the way of a serpent upon a rock. The way of a ship in the midst of the sea, and the way of a man with a maid. Such is the way of an adulterous woman. She eateth and wipeth her mouth, and saith, I have done no wickedness. For th three things the earth is disquieted, and for four which it cannot bear. For a servant when he reigneth, and a fool when he is filled with meat. For an odious woman when she is married, and an handmaid that is heir to her mistress. There be four things which are little upon the earth, but they are exceeding wise. The ants are a people not strong, yet they prepare their meat in the summer. The conies are but a feeble folk, yet make they their houses in the rocks. The locusts have no king, yet go they forth all of them by bands. The spider taketh hold with her hands, and is in king's palaces. There be three things which go well, yea, four are comely in going. A lion which is strongest among beasts, and turneth not away for any. A greyhound, and an he-goat also, and a king against whom there is no rising up. If thou hast done foolishly in lifting up thyself, or if thou hast thought evil, lay thine hand upon thy mouth. Surely the churning of milk bringeth forth butter, and the wringing of the nose bringeth forth blood. So the forcing of wrath bringeth forth strife. Beginning in verses 1 through 3 in Proverbs chapter 30, we see the words of Agur, the son of Jacob, even the prophecy, the man spake unto Ithiel, even unto Ithiel and Eucal. 
Surely I am more brutish than any man, and have not the understanding of a man. I neither learned wisdom nor have the knowledge of the holy. We are having here the introduction of Agur, the man who wrote this chapter in the book of Proverbs. He is not wise and openly declares that he is more brutish than any man, and brutish means stupid, that he is incapable of knowing these things, incapable of understanding this chapter without God, because God is he who gives wisdom, and that is the reason why Agur, a man who is brutish, a man who had no wisdom, a man who had no understanding, was blessed by this knowledge and information. Because we see in verse number four, who hath ascended up into heaven, or descended? Who hath gathered the wind in his fists? Who hath bound the waters in a garment? Who hath established all the ends of the earth? What is his name, and what is his son's name, if thou canst tell? Agur searched diligently for the truth of the Son of God. He searched diligently for the truth of the Word of God, for the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ, Almighty. And God blessed him because of his diligent search, even though he wasn't a man of wisdom, he wasn't a man of understanding, he wasn't a man of great knowledge or cunning or craftiness, he wasn't a man who was wise or intelligent. He was a brutish man, and above all, all others around him, brutish and brutish and brutish. Yet he searched diligently for the Lord Jesus Christ, and God gave him wisdom. God gave him the understandings of this chapter. God gave him the truth of the word of God. Because he searched diligently. The Bible tells us, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Search for him with your whole heart. That is what Agur did here. And that is what he's declaring. In the first three verses, it is his declaration of who he is. Who the man is that is writing this chapter. And how ignorant and foolish he was how brutish he was, but yet he searched for God. He searched for God, and he searched for the Son of God, and because of his search, he was blessed with wisdom and understanding and knowledge. And that is what God is trying to tell us here through the story of Agur, is that we are to search for God, and if we do, we will have God's wisdom. We will have God's understanding. Verses 5 through 6. Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. Verses 5 and 6 are a declaration of the pureness and protection of God's word. Believe God alone. God is declaring something here. That he is a shield to all them that put their trust in him, and every word of God is pure. And then he tells us, Add thou not unto his words lest he reprove thee and thou be found a liar. There are a whole lot of folks today who believe God or believe in a God that they call Jesus, but they don't actually believe the word of God. They believe in some kind of religious nonsense about Jesus, rather. They believe in a church and what they say rather than what the Bible has to say. Or they believe in their own personal beliefs rather than what the Bible has to say. You are doing exactly the opposite of what God wants you to do, and you are doing what God is warning us against here in verse number 6. When he tells us, Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. There are a whole lot of Christians today who are making God look like a liar with their personal beliefs. God hates that, and you will receive apt judgment and punishment for that. Add nothing to his word, or you will be reproved. You will be shown for your sin. Verses 7 through 9. Two things have I required of thee. Deny me them not before I die. Remove far from me vanity and lies. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food convenient for me. Lest I be fool and deny thee and say, Who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and take the name of my God in vain. This set of verses here is Agur's request to be removed from vanity and lies. Vanity and lies are the two things that he is requiring of God. And he is saying, deny me them not before I die. God, God can grant our blessings. He can help us in our lives to do that which is right. As long as we're seeking after the word and will of God. 
This is something that is honest and pure. For Agur to wish and pray for God to help him with these two struggles, vanity and lies, to keep him far from them. And then Agur actually defines, he defines what vanity and lies are. Poverty and riches. Now, these aren't the only vanity and lies in the world, but these are the vanity and lies that consume people daily. Poverty and riches. Poverty is vanity, and riches are lies. And then he tells us that he is telling God, feed me with food convenient for me. That's just saying, give me enough to be content with. That's all he wants in life. He doesn't want to have too much. He doesn't want to have too little. Just give him what is enough for him. And then he tells us why. Lest I be fool and deny thee and say who is the Lord. Everyone who is rich and thinks that their prosperity came of their own hand and not of God's blessings, they do this. That's why the Bible tells us in the book of Job, prosperity the destroyer has come. Because when people are full of their riches, they say, who's the Lord? I don't know this Lord you speak of. I did this all by myself. Agur understands this and doesn't want anything to do with this. He doesn't want anything to do with riches that lie unto him about whom the Lord is. And then he says, or lest I be poor and steal and take the name of my God in vain. So he doesn't want that vanity. He doesn't want poverty. And he doesn't want that because then he'll resort to sinful ways to feed himself. Now, there is something very interesting God is telling us here in verse number 9. It says, Or lest I be poor and steal, and take the name of my God in vain. The average Christian and the average human being on this earth who understands at all what blasphemy is, usually says it means something along the lines of saying, Oh my God, or GD, or other things like that. That that's what blasphemy is. Taking the name of God in vain. Taking the name of God in vain isn't just speaking his name without purpose. It's also carrying his name without purpose. That's what take means. It means to carry. means to have with you. Taking the name of God in vain can be done by your actions. Blasphemy is usually committed by your actions more than it is by your words. That's an interesting thought there. A whole lot of folks today are blaspheming God with their actions. Though they say with their words, I love Jesus, I love Jesus. Well, if you love Jesus so much, you would not bless that which is wicked. You would not tolerate or accept that which is wicked. Amen. Verse number 10. Accuse not a servant unto his master, lest he curse thee, and thou be found guilty. This verse here is telling us not to falsely accuse others. And the reason why is because if you falsely accuse someone and then they curse you because of your wrongdoing, because you falsely accuse them, and then you be found guilty, you will be, you will be deserving of the guilt and the sin and the judgment and the punishment that you falsely accused others with. This is a very dangerous situation because God tells us that we deserve worse than those we falsely accuse. Be careful who you accuse of anything. Make sure that you are accusing with adequate proof, perfect proof, in fact, evident proof that that person has done that wrong. Otherwise, don't accuse at all. Verses 11 through 14. There is a generation that curseth their father and doth not bless their mother. There is a generation that are pure in their own eyes, and yet is not washed from their filthiness. There is a generation, oh, how lofty are their eyes, and their eyelids are lifted up. There is a generation whose teeth are as swords, and their jaw teeth as knives, to, de to devour the poor from off the earth, and the needy from among men. God is giving us, in verses 11 through 14, something very interesting. Very interesting. This is the description of the wicked generation. This wicked generation is very familiar scenery. If you have lived at all in these recent years, and you wouldn't be listening to this if you weren't living at all in these recent years, uh, you would see something here. God wrote this 
chapter in the book of Proverbs, God gave this chapter in the book of Proverbs to the man Agur over a thousand years before Christ. A thousand years. That's 3,000 years ago this chapter was written, and yet it is somehow familiar scenery, and it is hitting the head right on the mark. Why? Well, because sin doesn't change, folks. Sin may get worse, but it's still the same. It's the same concepts, it's the same principles, it's the same evils. Generations who are not willing to bless their father and mother, who curse their father and their mother with their actions and their attitudes and the way that they act. Generations that think they're right. A generation that thinks they're right, though is not washed from their filthiness. What does that sound like? Everybody trying to justify themselves today in their pride and their sin and their disgusting abominations. There is a generation, oh, how lofty are their eyes and their eyelids are lifted up. This is pride. This is self-exaltation. This is saying, I'm better than God. I'm better than you. I'm better than everyone around me. And there is a generation whose teeth are as swords and their jaw teeth as knives to devour the poor from off the earth and the needy from among the men. This generation wants to become rich even if they destroy everyone around them to do it. You don't have to believe in God to understand that what is being written here is truth and a perfect example of everything around us today. And it should make you question, hmm, why is it that I don't believe in God? How is it that God can be so accurate about the world around us written 3,000 years ago if this was just given to us by a man? and not God himself. Very intriguing thought there, and something that you should strongly consider before you ever deny God. Why it is that he can be so accurate about man and about the world. Could it be because God is he who created us all? Verses 15 through 17. The horse leech hath two daughters, crying, give, give. There are three things that are never satisfied, yea, four things say not, it is enough. The grave, and the barren womb, the earth that is not filled with water, and the fire that saith not, it is enough. The eye that mocketh at his father, and despiseth to obey his mother, the ravens of the valley shall pick it out, and the young eagles shall eat it. Verses 15 through 17 are giving us the example of greed and dissatisfaction, as well as the consequence. Now the example of greed, we see it in verse number 15. The horse leech hath two daughters crying, give, give. This horse leech is just a leech that lives on horses, that feeds and feeds and feeds and continues to eat off this healthy horse, taking its blood and feeding its own family, continually doing so, never being satisfied. It would not be satisfied even if that horse were to die from the horse leech. There are three things that are never satisfied, yea, four say not, it, it is enough. Greed is a terrible and destructive device in man's hearts, given to us by that desire and lust for money, that love of money. And then God gives us examples of things that are never satisfied, things that are greedy as well, examples of where that sin goes. The grave and the barren womb, the earth that is not filled with water, and the fire that saith not it is enough. All these things consume and consume and consume and are never satisfied. And the eye that mocketh at his father and despiseth to obey his mother. The ravens of the valley shall pick it out and the young eels shall eat it. Why is this here? See, this is the consequence of your dissatisfaction. This, this is the consequence of you not being content with life. Because folks who are greedy will do whatever they can even to their own family, their own father and mother, mocking at their father and despising to obey their mother, to destroy their parents if they would possibly gain anything out of it. This is something actually that the Jews had a problem dealing with during the time of Jesus' walk on this earth in his ministry when they would say whatever would be profited of me from my parents after cursing their father and their mother is korban or a gift. Therefore, they don't have to be put to death even though they curse their father and mother because their father and mother profited off of them. Greed, greed and greed, more dissat dissatisfaction, and constantly wanting more and more and more. That is the desire of a wicked heart. And the consequences are here. 
the ravens of the valley shall pick it out, and the young eagle shall eat the eye that mocketh at his father and despiseth to obey his mother, the eye that is never satisfied, the eye that says, I want more, I lust after more, I lust after more, I desire more, I covet more. That is where you'll end, and that is where you deserve to be. Verses 18 through 20. There be three things which are too wonderful for me, yea, for which I know not. The way of an eagle in the air, the way of a serpent upon a rock, the way of a ship in the midst of the sea, and the way of a man with a maid. Such is the way of an adulterous woman. She eateth and wipeth her mouth, and saith, I have done no wickedness. Something we can see here, a pattern. God is giving us examples of things. And then he is showing us an antithesis or a consequence of these things. The Bible is telling us in verses 18 through 20, the wonder of God's creation. And then in verse number 20, the inability to grasp the evil of sin. You see, we see there be three things which are too wonderful for me, yea, four which I know not. And this fifth thing in verse number 20 is something else that I know not. So we see these four things, the way of an eagle in the air, the way of a serpent upon a rock, the way of a ship in the midst of the sea, and the way of a man with a maid. These things that God created that we just look at and we marvel and we say, wow, God's creation is too wonderful to understand. These things we don't know. We th these things we don't understand. We don't understand why God made it this way and not other ways. But then we also don't know the evil of sin. We don't grasp it. We don't really understand. Why is it that an adulterous woman can eat and wipe her mouth and say, I've done no wickedness? She has no conscience of what she's done. She says, ah, I've done no wrong. I'm living in perfect harmony. Because she is so detestable. She has so much evil in her that she is convinced herself that she has done no wrong. Verse number 21 through 23. For three things the earth is disquieted, and for four which it cannot bear. For a servant when he reigneth, and a fool when he is filled with meat. For an odious woman when she is married, and an handmaid that is heir to her mistress. Verses 21 through 23 are telling us of unnatural evils, things that are uncomely, things that are disgusting, things that are abnormal, things that are foolish. For three things the earth is disquieted, for four which it cannot bear. The earth can't bear these things. Even all of nature can't bear these things. That's how unnatural it is. For a servant when he reigneth. Well, he's a servant. He's not supposed to reign. That defeats the purpose of him being a servant. It's a paradox. It's a hypocrisy. And a fool when he is filled with meat. Well, fools shouldn't be filled with meat because God doesn't bless them. This is unnatural. This is evil. And a whole lot of quote-unquote good Christian folk will fill fools with meat and bless fools instead of blessing the righteous because they don't understand the righteous word of God and how we aren't to bless the foolish. And then it says, for an odious woman when she is married. An odious woman is an evil and disgusting woman who does wrong and nothing but wrong to her husband. Yet she's married. This is terrible. I feel sorry for that man. That's unnatural evil. And an handmaid that is heir to her mistress. A woman cannot be heir to her father or her mother. That's just not how it works, biblically. A man, a firstborn son, he is the heir. If a man and a woman have 30 children, and the first 29 of those children were women, and the 30th was a man, that man would be the heir of all that they have and possess. Does that mean that the daughters get nothing? No, but he would be the one to continue the line in the family and to continue the name of his father. All of these things are unnatural evils that God does not want anything to do with and doesn't want us to be a part of. Verses 24 through 28. There be four things which are little upon the earth, but they are exceeding wise. The ants are a people not strong, yet they prepare their meat in the summer. The conies are but a feeble folk, yet make they their houses in the rocks. The locusts have no king, yet go they forth all of them by bands. The spider taketh hold with her hands and is in king's palaces. Verses 24 through 28 are showing us the wisdom of God's creation and how that we could learn from this. 
There be many slothful and wicked folk out there who could learn from this. They could see the ants, a people not strong, yet they prepare their meat in the summer. They gather their food. They work. They work diligently. All these things can teach us. Nature can teach us because God has instilled his wisdom in all of creation. That's why the Bible tells us in Psalm 19, The heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech. Night unto night showeth knowledge. And there is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. In all of creation, it spells out God and his wisdom. And it yells from the rooftops, God made creation. Yet there are folks who deny it. Foolish. The fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. Verse 29 through 31. There be three things which go well, yea, four are comely in going. A lion which is strongest among beasts, and turneth not away for any. A greyhound, and an he-goat also, and a king against whom there is no rising up. In verses 29 through 31, God is showing us the beauty of God's creation. So, we've seen the wonder of God's creation, the wisdom of God's creation, and now the beauty of God's creation. These are all things that Agar was given from God's hand. And the reason why he was given it is because he sought the Lord Jesus Christ with all his heart and soul. To see the beauty of God's creation, to see the wisdom of God's creation, and the wonder of God's creation, Jesus answered him. And now he gave it to us so that we may declare it. And we may see, oh look, these things are wondrous and true. These things could not have existed and cannot exist without Almighty God, the Creator. We are not examples of a random explosion. Order doesn't come from chaos, folks. Order comes from order. God created all things, and we are to admire the wonder of God's creation, the wisdom of God's creation, and the beauty of God's creation. And verses 32 through 33. If thou hast done foolishly in lifting up thyself, or if thou hast thought evil, Lay thine hand upon thy mouth. Surely the churning of milk bringeth forth butter, and the wringing of the nose bringeth forth blood. So the forcing of wrath bringeth forth strife. Verses 32 through 33 are a warning from God against pride, against the sin of self-exaltation above God and above all others pride. It was the very first sin that was ever committed by Lucifer himself before he became Satan and was cast down to the earth because of his sin of saying that he was better than God and that he would sit in God's throne. Prideful man says that today. And God is warning us here, if thou hast done foolishly in lifting up thyself, if you have exalted yourself, or if thou hast thought evil, Lay thine hand upon thy mouth. God is wanting you to stop your mouth, stop your foolishness, stop your pride. Because surely the churning of milk bringeth forth butter, and the wringing of nose bringeth forth blood. So the forcing of wrath bringeth forth strife. You force God's wrath, and he will cause nothing but strife in your life because of your pride and arrogancy. Consider your ways, saith the Lord. Proverbs chapter 30, the words of Agar, given to him by God. In these words, written long ago, we see the reflection of today's world and have to ask ourselves, how can anyone doubt the word of God and its accuracy? All of God's creation was and is made marvel marvelously, become a part of God's creation. Become a child of the King. Be ye saved today, except the Lord Jesus Christ. For except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. I do want to thank you for joining me today as we took a deep dive into Proverbs chapter 30, the words of Agur, the prophecy given to him by God. 
I do hope that you would join me next time as we finish up the book of Proverbs in chapter 31, a very interesting and a very controversial chapter that is, for certain. It is not something that you will find taught in most churches or by most Christians because of what it says and how that it is contrary to the modern day. If you like this content, please like, share, subscribe, and leave a comment down below. Tell me what you think so far, and how that this study has helped you. And if you have any questions, I would be more than happy to oblige you with any answers if I can answer. But until next time, may you have a blessed day.